very lonely here. Okay, so uh, here goes. Uh, before I talk about corporate governance and corporate control, I just want to tell another anecdote related to uh, what someone mentioned earlier. I graduated from college in 81 and was an investment banker for two years. And before I was an investment banker, I read Breeley and Myers, which was brand new then. And when I went as an investment banker, having read Breeley and Myers, I basically knew more than just about everyone there because no one had read Breeley and Myers, or at least no one understood it. Uh, and it was a, a huge help. Uh, now everybody you know, who goes there has read it and understands it, or, or many people do. But Stu, thank you. And I just want to say it was uh, an awesome thing. And now let me talk about corporate governance. OK, corporate governance and uh, corporate control. And so what I'm going to talk about is first, what, what is the problem of corporate governance? And then I'm going to pick up where I think uh, Ken uh, and Stu left off by talking about the key research and insights in the 1980s. And, and I'm going to be very Chicago-centric. I, I apologize. It's basically going to be Chicago uh, authors. Uh, then I'm going to do key research and insights in the 1990s and then talk about where we are today. And I'm, I'm borrowing freely from, from two papers, so, so this is my thoughts, but it really is uh, uh, going to be um, influenced uh, greatly by those two papers. So what is corporate governance? Corporate governance sort of have three pieces to it. Uh, you have more or less the context and the rules, and the context is what's going on in your product market, and you do have competition. Uh, then it's what are the legal rules. And internal governance, you have shareholders, you have creditors, you have boards, and uh, you also have an external market for corporate control. And that's, that's more or less the, uh, the state of play or the, you know, the overall context. And the problem of corporate governance, uh, and this comes from Schleifer and Vishni, is how do suppliers of finance make sure they get a return on their investment. And in particular, you know, how do investors make sure managers don't steal? Uh, and how do investors control managers, you know, either from stealing or you know, from being stupid or you know, maybe as Richard said, from not being the best they can be. And, and I've got here citations, and, and the reason it's here is for the younger people um, to understand just how massively influential these papers were. And so the Schleifer and Vishni survey on corporate governance has 27,000 citations. I mean, that's more than I think most people on the faculty have in their entire career from all their papers. So it, is, it was just massively uh, influential. And um, I think it, it remains so and remains uh, correct. So the perspective that they take in the paper is largely an agency perspective. And there, there are really two pieces to that. Uh, the first is that ownership and control are separate. And so managers and owners have different cash flow incentives. And of course, this came from Jensen and Meckling, which has 125,000 citations. And, and Richard did not mention this. He's not here. Are you, is he gone? I can make fun of him. Excellent. Um, so he's here. Where is he? Oh, no. No. Um, so I'll still make fun of him. Um, so uh, Jensen and Meckling um, also is a paper that I think is right. So you, know, you said you know, Doug was right. I think Jensen and Meckling uh, is right uh, and has uh, again, has been massively influential. And Fama and Jensen also talk about uh, ownership and control being separate, and they talk about boards in that uh, paper. Uh, and uh, again, it's managers and owners having different cash flow incentives. And then the other very influential paper, the first one to do this, uh, was Grossman and Hart. Uh, and why are Grossman and Hart there? Grossman got his PhD at Chicago. Uh, and I think that his undergrad at Chicago, so we'll, we'll claim him as well. And ownership is the right to make decisions when contracts are incomplete. So it's not just the claims on cash flows, it's making decisions. 
So that's their perspective, and that's, again, they, they have, there's more to it than that, but it, it's a very nice way. They organize corporate governance. They go through the different pieces of it, and uh, uh, it was you know, persuasive in 1997, and it still is today. So what are the solutions in that paper? Uh, there are three solutions to the problem of corporate governance. The first is incentive contracts for managers, and that's, you know, a bit comes out of Jensen and Meckling. Uh, then uh, control rights to investors, whether it's large shareholders, uh, takeovers, which would be external, uh, and bank finance, which would be the creditors. Uh, and then there are legal protections, so the duty of loyalty, uh, to the corporation uh, and creditor rights. And, and again, those are, you know, I think those are, are right and uh, still with us today. So now let's, uh, let's go to applying this uh, to research in the 80s and the 90s. And so when I, you know, this is when I uh, became a PhD student, and the early empirical work in corporate was dominated by event studies. There's an event study for this, an event study for that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's why Gene taught corporate finance in one week. Uh, he's, he just went through the event studies and he was done. Um, so that was the, the state of play then. And then the 80s saw the rise of the hostile takeover, the junk bond market, shareholder activism, and it was a huge change from the 60s and the 70s. And, and at the time, the questions for academics and policymakers was why, why was this all happening? And were changes good or bad? And again, this was something where it was, was fiercely debated in the press, um, lots of different opinions. It was debated among academics as well. And uh, Mike uh, had a huge influence. I should also mention, uh, Mike was my PhD chairman. Uh, Gene was Mike's PhD chairman, so I'm like a grandchild. Uh, there are a couple of people here who I was chairman of, your great-grandchildren of, of Gene. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's uh, very nice uh, <laughs> that everybody is here. Um, so <laughs> We're all still alive. Uh, let's hope that continues, too. Um, so. The, you know, what did, what did Mike do? Mike had several papers um, that were, were again, uh, somewhat controversial at the time, and uh, basically um, have had a big influence. And so uh, his, his view um, on what was happening in the 80s was that the problem was managerial decisions. And I think he would have he would have called it personal benefits uh, rather than shareholder preferences. And you know, it's it's hard to distinguish as as we talked about earlier between you know a behavioral story where they were just wrong or made mistakes. Um, and uh, but for whatever reason, they were not optimizing for shareholders, and in particular, the agency costs of free cash flow. Uh, he said managers would prefer to keep the money in the company and not return the excess cash to shareholders. And in his view, you know, the solutions to this agency problem, and uh, in particular, the, the agency cost of free cash flow, was you had hostile takeovers, you had debt financing, uh, you had increased managerial ownership because he, he argued with Kevin uh, in the 1990 paper it was too low, and leverage buyouts, that all of those were, were efficient solutions uh, to the, the problem that managers uh, didn't have the same uh, incentives as shareholders. So that was um, the sort of the first thing. There were a couple of other you know, contributions worth mentioning. This is where, you know, this is the only time I'll mention my work. Um, you know, my thesis, I, you know, basically provided the first evidence that buyouts were associated with operating improvements. And there's a large subsequent literature that I would say is largely corroborative. And then there were a couple of uh, very important papers by uh, Schleifer and Vishny with co-authors. 
um, that found that unrelated diversification was value decreasing uh, and that the takeover wave undid unrelated diversification, which again was related to the fact that managers and shareholders didn't necessarily have the same incentives or that managers just you know, could make mistakes. So that's the 1980s, now let's come to the 1990s. So the 80s, most work uh, was done uh, on studies of US companies and there was very little work outside the US. Um, there were, were some, actually uh, Ragu and Luigi uh, did a couple and, and uh, the Ragu and Luigi paper on, on debt around the world is also um, massively cited uh, and influential. So now the, the question in the 90s was how is corporate governance and finance different outside the US and what can we learn from those differences? And can we say anything about the relative success or efficiency of different systems? And uh, this is where you know, law and finance uh, came in, which is uh, by LLSV, which is uh, Andre and Rob and Laporta and Lopez de Salinas. And what they did was you know, they studied the effect of legal system origin on corporate governance in 49 countries. And what was innovative about this is they, they used the legal systems in those countries, uh, which originated ages ago. So they were arguably exogenous. And the legal systems would be common law systems, uh, which basically England uh, or the UK and the US, uh, German and Scandinavian civil law, which is in the middle, uh, and French civil law, which was uh, the weakest uh, in terms of protections for investors. And what they found is that legal systems actually explained quite a bit, uh, and that concentrated ownership was strongly negatively related uh, to protection. So the legal systems explained outside protections, common law most protective, French law least, and to offset the lack of protections, you tended to see concentrated ownership. They also uh, had another paper uh, that looked at um, the different, the relation between legal origin and investor protections and financial development, and they more or less found you know, results consistent with that, uh, that countries that had the weaker investor protections had smaller and narrower capital markets. So that paper was hugely influential. Uh, the way they coded investor protection laws and uh, the legal origins you know, influenced just a large amount of research over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. And you know, the subsequent research you know, more or less finds you know, results that are uh, consistent with what they found. So that was uh, the LLSV. And then, you know, Ragu and Luigi um, also made big contributions here. Uh, and uh, the first one is they, they made use of the LLSV legal origin variables and asked, do differences uh, in financial patterns or development matter? And what they found is that where there are sectors that needed external finance, they grew more quickly in countries with greater financial development or more developed financial markets, which are again correlated with legal origin. So it was uh, you know, very consistent um, and additional evidence to go with LLSV. So that was good for LLSV. Then they, then they wanted to disagree uh, and they said LLSV uh, doesn't have an R squared of one. Um, nothing does. Uh, legal protections are fluid, and uh, so they um, added that political forces actually matter as well. And so in that paper, they just add, in addition to legal origin, political forces matter, and uh, that's uh, also, I think, uh, uh, true. So where are we today? Management of agency costs, which is the 80s, and Jensen, and which system is most efficient or best. And here's where, you know, again, Richard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the agency view has largely been vindicated. 
you've seen a meaningful increase in managerial ownership and pay for performance. Large shareholders and activists have increasing power over U.S. companies, and private equity has grown substantially over the last 30 years. And you know those developments create other issues. You know, like companies are in some sense, you know, some people too profitable. Um, but it's it really is a vindication um, of what Mike uh, and uh, others found in the 80s. And then which system is most efficient or best, um, you know, the U.S. system has done really well uh, in the last 25 years. European and Japanese companies and markets have stagnated, and so it's consistent both with the importance of agency costs, where these agency solutions are implemented uh, more aggressively in the U.S. than elsewhere, and it's consistent with common law legal systems uh, providing greater investor protection and encouraging greater financial and economic development. And uh, so the summary, Chicago finance has had a substantial influence on research and corporate governance. And that influence in turn has actually had a substantial influence on practice and policy and uh, I think in a, a positive way in terms of value creation. And there you go. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me back there? Can, can we you? need to change the... Uh, yeah. uh, let's see. Where? Okay. Uh, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming here. And uh, I'm going to make the same apology that uh, uh, Steve did, which is, this is not an exhaustive survey of developments in the area of financial intermediation, but more from a Chicago perspective. And uh, I came to Chicago in 1991. That was when we all used to come to office every day. And part of what kept us in office was the rumor that Gene used to take attendance during the weekend <laughs> to see if we were in office and uh, sometimes late at night. At any rate, we were there and it was fun. It was fun. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Chicago, tying back to uh, you know, the nature of, of Chicago. And, and obviously, we've seen today, uh, it's, it's a very broad tent. But the elements were really, it's tied to the real world. And it's both theory and uh, facts or empirical work but essentially, they feed on each other. So theory without facts, not particularly favored, nor is uh, empirical work without some underlying theorizing about why. Um, generally, the belief is markets work, relatively few frictions. And of course, government intervention uh, problematic. Now, this is, there are various Chicago schools. So at one point, there was a Chicago school which was much more communist. Uh, if you will, in orientation. Over time, this seems to be more uh, the Chicago school, but it is a big tent. There are lots of room for dissidents, many of whom are in this room, and the tent is getting bigger. So sometimes we struggle to say what exactly Chicago is. And of course, in this environment, uh, what is the space for financial intermediaries? Because they lie somewhere between uh, uh, you know, markets and, and government, it's, uh, it's actually an organization. Why should we have organizations? Why do they do any better than markets? And, and um, the early view was there was really no space for banks. Uh, the Great Depression, uh, you know, uh, Friedman Schwartz, caused in part by a collapse in money supply. And in this environment, banks were not particularly special, except they killed the money supply by a failing. And therefore, let's get rid of banks. That was the famous Chicago plan. Henry Simmons and five, six others uh, sent a letter uh, to the president at that time. And the idea was, let's have 100% reserves against deposits, essentially narrow banks. There's a payment function which is done by essentially uh, a, an entity which uh, has invested in government securities, safe government securities. And any kind of lending that you want done is done by longer term funds. So the uh, Dick's question about, you know, why do we have the run in, uh, in that movie? 
Oh, well, you could get rid of it by not having any banks anymore, just have these uh, essentially money market funds. And, and so we had to, in a sense, think, why do we have banks? Why didn't we get rid of them? And, and that question comes back after the global financial crisis, pro probably the most severe crisis in any of our lifetimes. And we have banks again, and we have a crisis again. And this question about narrow banking keeps coming back every so many years. Why do we really have banks? And I think the answer to that is really in a bunch of papers by Doug. Uh, and um, let me just uh, um, you know, lead up to it by saying there was also empirical work emerging at this time suggesting maybe there was something else rather than the money supply that was at work in the Depression. And Ben Bernanke, for the paper that he won the Nobel Prize for, essentially talks about the non-monetary effects uh, which is the bank failures raise the cost of credit because banks were special in offering credit and that added to the monetary effects. Now he's, he's careful not to dismiss the monetary effects but he says there was other stuff in addition. And Gene has a paper where in, uh, in 1985 where he says look it must be there's something special about banks because they have reserve requirements yet they survive. Um, I can understand that reserve requirements requirements on demand deposits, uh, well, they serve a payment function and they're getting paid, f uh, banks are getting paid for that. But what about uh, CDs? There are reserve requirements on CDs also. Uh, where do they essentially earn the rent uh, to pay those reserve requirements, which any other entity which issues claims in the market is not paying? Why is it that banks are special? Because they how is it that they can make the payments on these additional costs of raising money? And he basically says, look, this is monitoring uh, paid for by borrowers, and the banks are special because they use the deposit side to gain information about the borrowers. So this is one of the uh, early papers tying the liability and the asset side together. Banks are special because both the asset side and the liability side matter. Then we have Diamond Digwick, or earlier we have Diamond Digwick. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the relative timing of these. But Diamond Digwick basically says, look, um, here's another reason why this happens. Typically, we have long-term projects. Long-term projects have higher returns. Short-term projects have lower returns. Or long-term projects terminated early have, have uh, lower returns. And so in this kind of environment, supposing you don't know whether you need your money early or not. You can be an early consumer, you can be a late consumer. If you don't know and you know only exposed, this subjects you to a lot of risk. If you happen to be the early guy, you get your money back at a huge discount. If you happen to be the late guy, you make a killing. So can we do better? Can we have a kind of insurance mechanism between the early guy and the late guy? And the bank is essentially that insurance mechanism. And the way it works is that the guy who goes early goes for his money early, gets a lower rate of return, but higher than he would if he invested alone. And similarly, the guy who goes late gets a lower rate of return than if he had stayed out and invested long term, but higher than if, uh, for example, he turned out to be early. Essentially, you're insuring people against the risk of having liquidity needs. That's what the bank does. Right? So a risk-averse consumer would, would prefer this. The problem, however, is that it subjects the banks to runs. So, uh, Dick, the reason the bank is subject to runs is because of the function it performs. That is of giving the early guys a little more than they would otherwise get and giving uh, in that process, if too many people come early, if too many people suspect the bank is not good for its money, it collapses. And uh, that's why uh, what, what uh, um, uh, Doug basically shows is that it's hard to solve this problem in other ways. You're essentially solving a contracting problem, but you, where you don't know the types ex ante, and exposed, it is hard to verify who the types are, who are the late guys, who are the early guys. They can't prove it. Everybody uh, essentially is self-selecting in this, in this equilibrium and the run is inherent in the function. Now, there is a big debate between Doug and Charlie Jacklin where you know, Charlie Jacklin says, here's another way of doing it. E essentially, 
uh, the self-selection in Jacklin's model happens through trading rather than people going for their money. We don't need to go into the de details here. There's a debate and essentially they agree that there is an interim solution where if you have enough people not participating, the bank comes back as the optimal solution. Okay, so that's one facet. Doug has another paper at the same time, which uh, essentially offers another rationale for, for banks, and you can put both papers together, and we'll talk about that in a second. So in this, banks monitor borrowers on behalf of lenders. Now, uh, you know, a borrower can have low returns, either because they shirk, that's the bad action, or because they have bad luck. And what the bank does is it can prevent the shirking. And then all that's left is, in a sense, the, the bad luck. Um, the question then becomes, uh, yes, the bank can do this on behalf of a whole bunch of uh, lenders to the bank, but who monitors the bank? How do you make sure the bank is doing the right thing uh, by, uh, by its, its lenders? And, and the idea here is if you diversify across a whole bunch of borrowers, if the bank is diversified across a whole bunch of borrowers, and it's doing the right thing in eliminating shirking by those borrowers, all you've left is bad luck. And so long as you know the distribution of bad luck, in a sense, you can set the liabilities of the bank appropriately. And one way to set that liability is to set the bank up with high levels of debt and just enough so that so long as it eliminates all the shirking, it can make all the payments on the debt. That's a way of thinking of Diamond uh, 1984. So what that does, it is, has the facet of the bank, the bank essentially making loans others cannot make. That's the Bernanke sort of uh, view that it plays a role in credit, but also levering up a lot. And that's the kind of bank that we see. It doesn't have the demand deposit feature. Why uh, is bank debt demandable? And that's where we come to the third paper, uh, which Doug and I wrote in, in 2001. Uh, basically, uh, it's a slight variant on uh, both papers. Uh, in, in our paper, the bank has a greater ability to collect from the borrower because it has greater you know, recover, uh, uh, ability to recover. The problem is, this is a special ability of the banker. How do you pass it on to your financiers? Same question as Diamond 84. And this is where we say one way to pass it on to your financiers is to set up that demand deposit structure, which on a first come first serve basis, demand deposits get served. Essentially, in our structure, the runnable deposits are a commitment device. If the bank doesn't pay what it said it would pay, it faces a run. And that run essentially disciplines the bank because depositors essentially can kill the bank uh, on a first come first serve basis. Um, so in this kind of, of environment, it's not that the depositors need more information. Some people mistake this as saying they need more information. All the deposits need to do is constantly test repayment. And if you don't repay, they run. So it's, it's like driving with a stave on your steering wheel. Uh, basically, you make mistakes, you get killed. So the run, in this case, is not a bug. It's a feature of the banking system allowing you to pass on the, uh, the, the collection abilities to your lenders, which is why deposit finance is cheap until it kills you. It is really the cheapest form of finance. In this environment, bank capital is a buffer. Why do banks protest kicking and screaming when all of us are saying Modigliani Miller says capital doesn't matter, you shouldn't worry about it, but they complain all the time. And bank capital, in fact, you see when capital requirements are raised, banks actually do less activity. And that's consistent with the structure of banking being one where debt is actually important. Uh, and in this kind of environment, unlike Diamond and Divic, deposit insurance can be like capital, uh, yes, a source of buffer, but costly uh, to the system. Well, then we went to empirical work uh, in, in, at Chicago, and I think the, uh, Steve talked a little bit about it going abroad, and I think one of the most influential 
sets of work was by Hoshi Kashyap and Shafstein, where they looked at what was happening in Japanese firms and talked about how Keretsus were actually solving some problem, which is that investment there was less sensitive to liquidity than in non-Keretsu firms, and also they coped better with distress. Now, 20 years later, we asked, was this all good? Were they sometimes investing too much? Uh, were they protecting some of the people who should have gone bankrupt a little more than they should have? But that's sort of the uh, yin and yang of relationships. It can be really good, uh, but it can also protect the, the, the weak and the, the, the entities that should be shut down a little too much. Now, Mitch and I, uh, Mitch Peterson and I did some work uh, on small businesses trying to show the same thing, banking relationships improve access to finance. And Kwajan Myam, which has become a, a kind of, uh, um, uh, what's it, workhorse for anybody who wants to supply side uh, effects in banking, uh, essentially show that uh, liquidity shocks uh, to the banks affect small client firms. All these are basically substantiating the view that banks are in some sense special in terms of, of credit. Um, the next wave was essentially going deeper. And uh, you know, we accept the fact that banks actually play a role. Now who borrows from banks? Who borrows from markets? A and that's where a bunch of papers by Doug look at, you know, first you start borrowing from the banks, build a reputation, then you're able to go out into the markets. Uh, similarly, questions like who's senior, who's junior? Bank debt, short-term senior, bonds, long-term junior. Uh, Doug has a theory for why that, that happens. And then we go into the you know, empirical details. What do we actually see in intermediary contracts? Very influential paper by Steve and, and, and Per Stromberg, which looks at venture capital contracts and gives us some first information as to what these contracts look like. Are they really consistent with all this theorizing about control rights, et cetera? And they say, yes, there is something there. And of course, Amir with uh, Nini and Smith look at creditor control rights and say, out of bankruptcy, there are these control rights exercised through the violation of covenants and how you basically uh, you exert control in a way to affect the real decisions of firms. So that's going deep and there's a lot more work. I don't want to uh, I don't have the time to talk about that. Let's also go big. How does all the special nature of banks play out in the transmission of monetary policy? Do we have a bank credit channel? And uh, uh, Anil with Jeremy have uh, a bunch of papers, one of which is a 2000 paper, uh, in a sense, small banks, which are less liquid, tend to transmit these uh, monetary effects much more uh, by, by shrinking their lending. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of papers before the crisis. I have to tell you, you know, when I joined um, in, the, in the 90s, uh, banking, uh, when banking sessions were announced at the AFA, that was a signal for everybody to leave. <laughs> because this was history. We were talking about you know, deposit insurance and this and that. All that was passé. This was 1930s. Yeah, there were some bank failures in the, uh, in the 1980s, SNLs, but you know, how much can we worry about SNLs? Big banks are safe. They're wonderful, they're well managed, no problem anymore. And so this kind of work that we were doing before the financial crisis was is, is an aberration. We were talking about stuff that was not really happening in industrial countries. I think um, one uh, uh, very influential piece of work for all that follows is the work by Schleif and Vishni, Liquidation, Value, and Debt Capacity, where they basically argue that, look, liquidation values matter, and there are some entities that have a better ability to operate the asset. They have a high value for the asset. The problem emerges when they don't have enough buying capacity, when they don't have enough funds, the asset then goes into second and third hands, and therefore is valued much less, and that ca can cause a whole variety of problems. This becomes the basis for a lot of thinking in banking, including uh, sort of the paper that Doug and I have, but a lot of other work where, you know, where it goes matters, and uh, going away from the specialist to the generalist becomes a problem. And to some extent, I, I would say limits to arbitrage is an example of that. 
where the specialists who can shrink the arbitrage don't have the capital, uh, sufficient capital to sustain it, and as a result, you find prices move away from what might be a reasonable level of prices. Um, I think it's sort of a development of Schleifer Vishni 92. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same sort of background idea floating. And, and then um, Doug and I have a couple of papers which look at applying this kind of thought in a, in a, in a broader context where the specialists are the banks. Remember, they have special capabilities, but if they run out of funding, then there could be a contagion of failures because it, the, the bank is the only one that has the ability to run that asset. It gets sold at a fire sale price, and fire sale discounts uh, essentially bring other banks down. And, and finally, I mean, just to, uh, this is just to say link between uh, theory and, and actually uh, you know, public uh, connection. Uh, all this research allowed me to sort of think about what was going on in the markets then. And I gave a speech talking about how easy financial conditions and bank search for yield was leading to much uh, greater tail risk taking. Uh, this was at Alan Greenspan's farewell, which uh, previewed the, uh, what happened in the financial crisis a little bit. Um, finally, we had the global financial crisis where you know, the history that uh, people thought we were talking about became reality. And uh, you know, Doug's, uh, Ben Bernanke keeps talking about how Diamond Dibbig was required reading during the global financial crisis. And, and to some extent, Chicago also was quick to try and understand the details of what was happening. Not just what was happening to the banks, but why we got there. So uh, Amir uh, and Atif's work uh, on uh, what was happening to mortgage credit uh, how it was going to the subprime areas, divorced from income growth, and also how the kind of leverage in the households led to macroeconomic effects. I think this was very, very, and has been very, very influential post-global financial crisis. Amit's work on how securitization led to lax screening and also led to uh, you know, uh, bad outcomes. And of course, um, uh, Zico's work uh, on intermediary asset pricing, which I would say is again a development of, uh, of uh, you know, the schleifer vishni idea that, that the specialists have greater capabilities and the capital that the specialists have is really very important in determining asset pricing. And if the specialists don't have enough capital, asset prices can go out of whack. And uh, that's the intermediary asset pricing to some extent. So uh, that's sort of a uh, tour de table till, uh, till you know, 2013, 14. I'll, I'll stop here and let the next panel talk about what happens afterwards, but happy to take questions along with Steve. So private credit funds have been one of the fastest growing areas in private equity. And you know, private equity has been such a, a, a durable way of organizing capital, presumably because it addresses many of the corporate governance problems that Steve talked about. Do you see private credit as, or the, the emergence of private credit funds as something that sort of fundamentally challenges the way we think about what banks are and what they do? Or, or do you see it just as a, a, an anomaly, there's an, an outgrowth of, you know, Peculiar regulation. And I was going to ask that too because they're only David. I'd add is they're only fifty percent leveraged as opposed to the banks, which are you know eighty ninety percent leveraged. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we have. Uh, I should advertise Yang Su's work. Uh, he's he's working on some of these issues. Look, uh, I I I think there are there are two potential a explanations. Uh, one, of course, is that, yes, this is, I mean, you can get this kind of credit. The question is, at what, what price? And uh, maybe what is happening is we've, uh, you know, to your first point, we've regulated the banks enough and forced enough capital on them that they become less and less effective at doing, you know, the, the natural thing, and other entities start coming up as, as alternatives. 
Now, I think it's important to sort of go through a full cycle with private credit and find out what happens in terms of losses and so on. But nothing in the theory suggests this cannot be done by less levered institutions. The question is, how costly is it? And uh, what kinds of activities are they going to do? And, and we need more work of the kind that Jiang is doing to say, what exactly are they doing? And are they added sort of supports which the banks don't have? And if, uh, if those supports are needed, uh, you know, do you still need the banks? So, so it's, 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 I think seeing these other institutions is quite important and uh, trying to see how they overcome the problems that the banks uh, overcome. Uh, Jay Ritter, University of Florida. Uh, Steve was talking about corporate governance uh, before. And w one thing, one pattern uh, that has occurred in the last five years is a lot of tech companies going public have had dual class shares with uh, d managers controlling uh, d votes, uh, e even though they've got less cash flow rights. Uh, and yet the market seems to have been pretty complacent at, at accepting this. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be uh, pricing uh, Google and Facebook and uh, many of these other more recent uh, firms uh, at a significant discount, even though there are some potential uh, managerial rent extraction issues there. I, I, I was wondering, Steve, if, if you have some thoughts on why there's been this complacency about accepting managerial control? So that's a really good question. I would say first, the, the complacency, I think, is less, or there will be less complacency uh, subsequent to FTX and some of the, the big flameouts that we've just seen, and FTX in particular, which was um, sort of the, the exception that proves the rule, because there was no governance and uh, it blew up. But that said, I think what happened, you know, you have Google um, and, and Facebook, which are, are your two big examples, and uh, they were massively successful in terms of the, the founders um, in the Google case are no longer running the company, but they, they own, and, and while they have control um, without owning the whole thing, they still have quite quite big cash flow rights. And that seems to have worked there. And Facebook, uh, the same thing with Zuckerberg. So I think the, you know, you can call this, I don't know if it's behavioral corporate finance or, or, or what it is, but it seems to have worked for those two. And uh, while it works, people, um, I think, say, well, maybe it works until it doesn't, and then people adjust. So um, th that would be my, the best explanation I can give. Uh, as, as finance people generally don't talk a lot about corporate culture, but uh, a lot of these companies with the dual class shares uh, in, in recent years, unlike say 40 years ago, I also have employees with a lot of equity linked compensation. Uh, not, not just management, but uh, lower level employees as well. Uh, is, is it possible that, that uh, Part, part of the apparent lack of uh, severe agency problems is because uh, managers like happy employees who, who are happier when the stock is doing well? I don't, you know, both Google and Facebook have very good businesses for, you know, because there, there are network effects and they're, they're very efficient. So whether, whether it's that, you know, the employees owning stock and having done well, um, certainly aligns them more than you'll see in other companies. So, you know, what, what drives it? Um, probably some of, you know, all of the above, but, you know, hard to know with two examples, you know, what it is. You'd need more examples, I guess, to really test that. Right. Uh, I think, Steve, you, you mentioned this, but it was also part of what Raghu uh, sort of said. Uh, you seem to suggest that we have a good sense of 
what the right go corporate governance practices are, how intermediation should be run. Uh, why do you think the best practices are not being followed everywhere in the world? What, what, what's missing? And if the word starts with P, I'm surprised that neither of your talks had the word politics in it. So, right, the answer is definitely, you know, politics is a piece of it. I mean, you look at, at Europe, and it's very different in terms of um, their, you know, how do I, how do I say this uh, appropriately? You know, it's a, I mean, it's an income inequality issue, which is true really everywhere. When, when people make money um, and make a lot of money, that has political consequences, and we see that in the U.S. I think those views are stronger in Europe, and so the antipathy to people making money uh, and providing these incentives in, in Europe and Japan are stronger than they are in the U.S. The U.S. has a history of uh, more independence in that regard, and I think that's that's part of the reason uh, that they you you have not seen the same um, structures there that you see here. Um, yeah, I, you know, is it the legal system? I I don't know. That may have something to do with it too, which is also political. Um, so that would be you know a story. And you see, the U.S. has just done very well over the last twenty or thirty years. I think because it does allow incentives and it does attract talent, and uh, you've seen that. It's also a flip side. I'll say another thing. It's also the reason you see private equity being very successful in Europe, because the private equity firms in Europe can actually pay their uh, managers in a way that is, you know, not seen uh, by the public because they're not publicly filing. And I think that's that's actually been a big. Uh, benefit to private equity in Europe. Yeah, uh, on the politics side, I mean, this also changes over time, right? And what, what is interesting is maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, there would be a lot of concern about intervention in markets in the US. Uh, we had perhaps the most massive intervention in protecting uninsured demand deposits in March of this year. Where do you hear a hue and cry about why we did this and whether this makes sense. And so I think politics also changes and maybe that may change, you know, we, we talked a lot about zombie firms being protected in Japan. Well, there's a lot of, uh, you know, potential for doing that in other countries also, especially as the politics gets, gets ugly and nobody wants to take hard decisions. And, and maybe then the markets work less well and maybe the US system becomes a little more difficult. I don't know. Although, it's, it's although, something although it can change in the U.S. I think yeah. that's part of, you know, the, the view to, you know, corporate purpose and some of the antipathy to, to companies being so successful is, yeah. is a reaction to that. So I think, yeah, you yeah. know, it could change. It's all, yeah. it's all fluid in politics. You know, it's Luigi and Regu back to uh, their paper. It, it, you know, it matters. Steve, can I just add one comment on this? <clears throat> um, I think if you look at the early literature, you were citing the you know, Laporta et al. and, and Schleife Wishney work on institutions, and there was sort of also literature on growth, right? And that literature was often saying you can find results for financial development, but you, you're not finding results for whether that's bank or equity-centric, sort of along the lines of what Ahmed was saying, why isn't the rest of the world organized like the U.S. is? And I think there was, on the growth side, it wasn't clear that one economy type of economy setup was performing better than the other. What I think has changed in the last, whatever, 20, 25 years is that these systems that I think Europe, for instance, had work well when you have a relatively not as open a an economy, when you can sort of organize things maybe reasonably well among insiders, that I think is no longer possible. And I think you see in Europe that all these economies are basically transitioning to something that actually does look more like on many dimensions mm. like the US, mm. but it, it takes a while for all these complementary in institutions to adjust until you kind of get right and you have frictions along the way. Very interesting. I wanted to ask Raghu about GFANS. Were you surprised the banks signed up for net zero commitments? Or, and why do, you, why do you think they, they didn't pull out when Vanguard and others did, or when GFANS came out with European looking? GFANS policy. 
Well, I, I, I think Luigi can speak to this also. I mean, look, <laughs> uh, you know, banks are pub playing a public relations game also. And I think that uh, it's very hard for them to go against the, uh, the grain, which is that corporations should be doing something. I think so long as it's not, doesn't involve deep monitoring of what they're doing, they'll sign up to anything. Uh, uh, you're, the problem you're the cynic, Ragu. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we've become more cynical after actually looking <laughs> at what they do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I do think there are committed uh, sort of uh, people in every sector trying to do their best. But to my mind, uh, uh, that's a personal view. I, I, I really think that, uh, you know, if we want to make uh, change on uh, on the green side it requires government action or it, it requires technological change uh, if you don't have either I don't think relying on corporations to get it right is going to be the answer so I, I, I'll, I'll take a less negative view on that which will shock you know Adair probably I think for for what's not clear now and what's what's hard is what is value maximizing and I think there, there is some sense in which doing something here may be value maximizing for some banks because it's happening, there's demand for it, and they're doing some. So you, you, there's probably some role for government here, um, but there's also like, like private incentives which, which have surprised me and aren't, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, but... The, right. <laughs> Well, then you have entities like BP, which say we're going to do this and thus and such, except when, when, it, I, I when, when suddenly it becomes more profitable to do something else. I just think that this is something we have to be more careful about. So I, I have a question about bank capital requirements. Uh, and listening to you, Raghu, about talking about Doug's work and your work with Doug, uh, there's occasionally you hear a picture of a bank that uh, would be damaged if it had too much capital because the whole setup is relying on the threat of the depositors running if the bank doesn't do its job and doesn't monitor properly and so on. Uh, my first question is whether, do I have that right that you want some fragility in the bank to keep its doing its other jobs? And if I am, what do you think of a, 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 modern, a modern body saying banks ought to go up to 25% capital? Yeah, we've, we've had the debate with Anath. Uh, I'm not sure why she would limit it at 25%. Why not, why not entirely equity financed? Well, that would be direct banking, I guess. Is that direct it's, banking? It's finance company, right? Yeah, and, yeah and, that's and, right. And what I guess what we're saying is uh, the level of... So you have to be a very strong believer in corporate governance that somehow boards will get it right uh, if you want an entirely equity financed financial institution. And they will be able to monitor on a daily basis what's going on. I mean, having sit, sat on the board of a bank, I can tell you, you know Zippo of what's going on underneath. <laughs> you have to trust the management to get it right. And so in that sense, what I'm saying is these guys who, I mean, Assuming that somehow we'll get the corporate governance right, given how complicated the underlying is, uh, uh, seems a little uh, bit of a stretch. And this is where having the liability structure, and uh, Doug is, uh, wants to answer this question, so I'll, uh, <laughs> but having the liability structure cooperate is part of the answer, that, that you can't get away with too much mischief for too long before it gets honored. So let me chime in on this as well. I mean, it's not that if they, the banks had way more equity, they wouldn't do their job of monitoring. The idea is if the bank is doing something which they're ex post, the only people that can do it, so the asset's illiquid. Uh, the bo I mean, so the one thing about our model is the bonus pool that gets paid out is some fraction of the equity in the bank. It's the value added part of the equity that the insiders provide. So if you're all equity, let's imagine they had bargaining power to take half, uh, 
then they'd have huge bonus pools and there'd be a huge competition to get these jobs because of the ex post bonuses. So if you want to keep your bankers down to just making, you know, 400,000 a year or something like that, you can't be too highly, you need a certain amount of, of leverage there so that the, what you're bargaining about is the excess value over the amount of debt that has to be paid off because this commits them to pay it. So it's not so much that they wouldn't monitor, it's just that the, the, the fraction of the rents that go to insiders goes up as you, as you get more and as you get better and better capitalized. So the, the ideal, like our first paper, the assets are riskless, right? So it's not like about you know, sharing the risk, it's just about making sure you pay out the certain amount. The, the, the 2000 paper, the one on, on capital that Raghu mentioned, that one there, there's a trade-off because the more equity you have, the l less risky your deposits are, which is a good thing, but the more the bonuses go. So that, that's sort of the way our model thinks about this. It's not, it's not about incentives to monitor, it's about how much, uh, go, how much of the stuff you can commit to pay it outside. Or, or put differently, why are bankers not paid like venture capitalists? Yeah. But That's the difference. And, th and this goes back to David's question, which is a puzzle, which we'll see. The direct lenders are paid somewhere in between, right? They have right. The, the, you know, That's the management fee and, and carry, and they've got a trillion yeah. dollars of assets yeah. now. So it's a, real, right. it's a really interesting so, question. Right. You should read Young, Young Su's paper. He's on the market yeah. this year. He can, he can raise his <laughs> hand over there. And by the way, in his paper, all the, I don't know if this is true in general, the people who borrow from these private debt funds are also... Um, private equity yeah. financed. So they got, the private equity guys are already monitoring them and these, these guys are monitoring them. So it's like, it's sort of a selected sample that they can lend to. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm saying, it, we, we know that's how it's but worked. It's, so but that it's selected, it may it's not selected. be generalized, yeah. Right. It, yeah. it could be that the, the guys who borrow from, from banks wouldn't be able to borrow from these guys. Ah. So, so now we get in, in, into the hard part of the, the the reason our paper has a long appendix in the JVE. So, so he, okay. So the, the the answer is, the bank just by monitoring just commits the firm to pay a third party. They're just affecting a transfer. The firms actually add value. So if you got rid of the management of, of most firms, you couldn't actually do the business they're doing. You could run the firm fine without their bank. So the run transfers the rent from, from the, the, the monitoring, whereas a, a run and a failure on a firm, as opposed to being a good thing, it's a bad thing because you then liquidate the firm for, for its second best value. That, that's why, in our model, that's yeah. why it's true. So, so Donald Trump survives to, you know, day after day with multiple bankruptcies. A banker gets killed and never shows up again. So that's, that's the difference. <laughs> good. Very good. I think we're, we're up. Any, we're yep. good? Okay, thank you.